Netflix has a massive hit with the two popes. Do you know the Beatles? Yes, I know who they are. Of course you do. <laughs> Eleanor Rigby. Who? It's a movie about two very different characters, two different theologies, and two different visions for the church. <laughs> but is it any good? Is it historically accurate? And how will it be heard by a Catholic culture currently in the grip of what some have called a cold civil war? We've brought in experts on Catholic media and communications to discuss these questions. From the Archdiocese of Halifax, Yarmouth, we're joined by Communications Director Aurea Saudi. And from the Christian Medical and Dental Society, we're joined by Communications Manager Stephanie Potter. God always corrects one pop by presenting the world with another pop. I should quite like to see my correction. Aurea, strange as it may sound, some people may not have seen the the global (laughs) extravaganza that is the two popes. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about it? What is the two popes? The two popes is a movie, a story, if you will, that just speaks to who these two men are. Um, I think it it brings us to a, a what if position, mm-hmm. a position where what if these two men had a relationship prior to becoming the two popes? And what kinds of conversations would they have? Mm-hmm. So they take us from basically the conclave, the first one, uh, where Benedict is elected, then kind of through some of his reign, for lack of better terms, <laughs> um, and into kind of when he's making that decision uh, to resign. Mm-hmm. Uh, that big impactful decision to resign and then we have this conversation which we now know is fiction mm-hmm. that uh, Francis and Benedict have as Benedict or Francis is called to Rome by Benedict right. and at first we start in the garden and then we move into a, I guess it's a, a day or two I can't quite get the timing of it of the two of them having various conversations that reveal things about um, the experiences in their lives that have formed them, Mm -hmm. which is really quite interesting. And then it concludes with the next conclave. And, well, we all know what happens Mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Is it any good? Visually, absolutely. Right. It made me want to go back to Rome. Right. Uh, um, and the casting was really good, I yes. thought. I mean, there was jokes when Francis was elected. Oh my gosh, doesn't he look like, uh, I can't remember the actor's Jonathan Price. Jonathan yep. Price. And even I was like, oh man, ooh, that's harsh. Yeah. There's going to be a movie. We knew in that moment they had yep. to do it before Jonathan yeah. Price died. So, yeah. <laughs> Visually, absolutely. I agree with you. Visually, mm-hmm. and, and the actors were fantastic. Mm-hmm. I, Maybe uh, the casting, some questions there, but Mm -hmm. um, they're both actors with great chops Mm -hmm. who put themselves all in. Even the younger actors, or the actors who played the younger versions Mm -hmm. of of Benedict, uh, Mm -hmm. or not Benedict, I'm sorry, Francis, Mm -hmm. uh, I found was -hmm. was a good actor as well. So it it pulled you into the story Mm -hmm. um, and showed a real... uh, showed a part of our church that, that nobody really talks about or knows about, mm-hmm. right? And it showed the, the humanness in both of these men that uh, people forget that, mm-hmm. yeah, these guys are popes, but they're also Jorge Bergoglio and um, Ratzinger, whose first name has totally Joseph. Thank you. Because <laughs> <Joseph. laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm trying to, there's two of them. So exactly, to try to confuse yeah. which one is which. Yeah. And I think but, in, <clears throat> in this modern age where we have so much intimate access to everything, like yes. we think about yep. um, the Trump White House, because of the quantity of leaks, we know everything, every little detail yeah. about what hamburgers he ate practically. We want that about something that has historically been so secretive. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's, there's rules about what you can and can't say about yeah. the conclave. You know, <laughs> we know there's little leaks here and again about, oh, you know, so-and-so was the next on the ballot or whatever. Um, but this desire to know that has sort of expanded into this sort of fictional based on nuggets so that you're, you're sort of, especially if you're a person who keeps up with this, um, mm-hmm. you're sort of left 
uh, flat-footed a bit because I know some of that's true. I know some of the stories about Argentina are true, and I know some of mm-hmm. the reality of why Benedict resigned. You know, we don't know all of it. We know yep. some of it. So you're sort of left going, I don't, I can't parse the truth from the fiction. So I just sort of enjoyed it as a lovely piece of fiction. Yeah. Yeah. It was a good story. Yeah. It was mm. a good movie visually, mm. acting wise. Um, I, I think that's why you see people really speaking positively about it. They may have their certain qualms about various mm-hmm. um, uh, facts, mm-hmm. <laughs> whether they are yeah. fact or fiction, but because visually and acting wise and content wise, it it tells a good story. And humor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of humor lot, there. A lot more humor than I had yeah. anticipated or, or expected. A lot of one-liners. At both yeah. of their like, expense. Oh. Yeah, exactly. Yes. It wasn't, yeah. at first it felt like it was a lot of sort of at Benedict's mm-hmm. expense. Um, they portrayed him as sort of a doddering old fool in some scenes, but then very sharp and very clever. <laughs> what was really funny to me with that was the whole sense that Benedict has a Fitbit. I know. That would tell him to move every <laughs> time. And I'm like, does he really? Where did Does they he? get that piece? And I don't think that that's an accurate representation no, of him as a person. No. Like we know him as a, a vibrant. Uh, one of my friends yeah. used to work for him in in the Vatican, and it is this vibrant man who wasn't sitting still. Mm-hmm. He was up, out, and about, and and uh, so sharp and so clever. So for me, I you know I have such an emotional attachment to him. Mm. Seeing him just sort of be kind of. Uh, just a lovely man mm-hmm. who's got a very human reality of like, yeah, I've got to get up, I got to move some more, I got to do something. It was just strange to me. I was yeah. like, oh. Well, I think it was, yeah. Well, f- before mm-hmm. we get to that, um, mm-hmm. what tell us about the the characterization of the two people. Mm-hmm. So who yes. who was the Benedict and who was the Francis that we were introduced to in the movie? Yeah, it's tough because I've only known Francis as the media spin version of him. Um, I wasn't highly familiar with his life and his works before he became Pope. I went and researched him. Uh, to me, it felt um, true to some really essential parts of his character, but really missed some of that sort of the humanity of Francis that we know. Mm. Um, there was an incident, uh, not an incident, there was a thing that happened, I guess, a couple weeks ago where that woman tried to grab... It was an incident. It was an incident. <laughs> it became a thing. I don't know if it's because yeah. I had spent a lot of time on Twitter. Yeah. Um, where a, a woman of some sort of, from some Asian country, I've heard Japanese, I've heard China, yeah. um, grabbed onto him and, and, and wanted hold to hold on. And she grabbed him and you could tell he was hurt, he was injured, and you could see his humanity he had a little scowl he kind of smacked her hand a little bit you know that the humanity of francis is something that sort of you kind of love and you kind of don't love you know we we want him to be like the way we remember john paul ii Mm -hmm. who near the end of his life was just sort of sweet and gentle we forget you know him going to poland and sort of cussing people out for communism and and things like that um so francis i yeah i was sort of walking the line but they they left him a bit too sweet in some ways and then a bit sour where he didn't belong so before we get to the to, to, to the potential historical mm-hmm. flaws, mm-hmm. they presented him as you're saying <coughs> very sweet and a reformer. He was a guy who was willing to challenge. He was a guy who the average um, liberal person would like. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's fine. I and think challenge what. But challenge the structure of the church, the hierarchy, the, the the sense of the richness of the church and not caring for the people on the ground. So we're seeing him uh, serving at a soup kitchen and, and wearing old shoes, which we know that yeah. stuff is true. And he's the first Christian to ever do either. Oh, I know. Yeah. It's true. Absolutely. We're all terrible people. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> nobody. Jesus wants to just Nobody. Nobody. No, nobody. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. not. But yeah, that, that's what I found that. They played up the extremes. Exactly. Right? For both characters. It I was think. funny, though, because having watched him in Game of Thrones playing the High Sparrow, serving yeah. in the soup kitchen, uh-huh. it was like a little like, oh, this feels false because of that. Yeah. Nobody, yeah. I'm sure, but me was thinking about Game of Thrones while watching a movie. Oh, about no. Pope. Like Jonathan Price. <laughs> of course, he's, yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's the High Sparrow. Game. That's it. Yeah. Um, so, from that perspective, I thought they sort of played into some tropes about him that were not untrue tropes, but they, they cast him as someone different than the rest of the church. Mm-hmm. Someone that no other, like uh, maybe a so. few little cardinals yeah. were, you know, in favor of him, but he was the only one really living it back yeah. home in Argentina, in the, you know, in the dirt. Um, and it was interesting, based on media trips about Benedict, I thought they really didn't play into a lot of those. They made a joke about um, the Rottweiler, God's Rottweiler, um, but there wasn't a lot about how Benedict had been bringing back some of the older vestments, you know, the big luxurious stuff, um, which gave this impression of his love for the richness of the church um, rather than the tradition. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, So, yeah, I thought it was interesting. They didn't spend as much time Mm -hmm. on Benedict's character. So who was Benedict in this? Uh, I'm not asking you who was Benedict Mm. in in reality, but but in this, let's Mm. say you are a... um, a ninth generation atheist <laughs> <laughs> who has who has it doesn't even know there's a thing called the Catholic Church. Yeah. Um, you've that's your entire your only exposure, and someone mm-hmm. asks you who was the guy they called Pope Benedict. What, what would you say on the basis on the basis of the movie? Of the, of yeah, the movie? he was um, an extremist. Although they didn't get into a lot mm-hmm. of that, um, which was interesting. There was references that only if you knew Catholicism mm-hmm. you would get the Congregation for the Doctrine, but mostly that he was a failure. The focus on the sex abuse crisis near the end of the movie. Um, was they sort of played into he was a man who had failed and given up and wasn't willing to fight. Right. He was a man who had given mm-hmm. up the fight, I thought. That was the end moment or where he was just sort of a man looking for hope. Um, mm-hmm. A man who claimed to be a conservative, but at heart he really wasn't. He was just too weak to be the liberal. And, and that was how I saw it because he saw Bergoglio, who at first he didn't like. Obviously, there's a bit of that, I don't like you and that's why I wouldn't leave because I thought you'd be the next pope. In the end, he, he sort of points to... Francis as a salvific figure for the church, someone who's going to renew mm-hmm. and change mm-hmm. the church that he was too weak um, to change. Yeah. So that was that was the impression I was left with just on a surface level about him. Um, he was smart but getting old and doddering and weak. And was That's the impression that I mm-hmm. felt as well, that it was that weakness that they played up mm-hmm. as opposed to the myriad of other <laughs> factors that we exactly. played in there that none of us really are privy to. No, exactly. Mm-hmm. At this point. So it was it was interesting, yeah, that they didn't spend the time learning enough. I mean it's not like Ratzinger doesn't have ton of books to read, Mm -hmm. some of which are autobiographical, that they could have learned some. So they they spent a lot of time talking about Bergoglio and his time in Argentina during, um, you know, the the trials there. And then they don't spend any time talking. Benedict had an opportunity to say, I grew up in Nazi Germany. I was conscripted into the Hitler Youth, and that was awful, and I hated it. They didn't give him any time of day to make him a complex character. He's very flat. Which is, mm-hmm. yes, uh, which is one of the, the criticisms of the film that mm-hmm. I felt as well, that there wasn't that balance between mm-hmm. the two. It was called The Two Popes, but it was about one pope. It was the one pope. Okay, and his side interesting. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it was a succession story that was very much, uh, Bergoglio yeah. was the only possible successor based on this. We didn't spend any time on the other people. We mentioned yeah. Martini, who was the other person who was a Papa Bile, someone we thought would become the next pope, mm-hmm. perhaps. Um, and just, even he's he's just a supporting, yeah. and he should be just a supporting character, yeah. to be fair in the context. But they didn't give any reason why Bergoglio was better than him, why yeah. people chose it. It was just the conclave happened. And that was that. And, and they spent more time on that initial conclave, mm-hmm. Benedict's conclave, as opposed to France. It was just... It, it was a foregone conclusion. It almost felt like they just uh, rehashed some of the same shots. I think from, they did. Which I, I'm assuming that they did from the from that first shooting of, of the conclave. Mm-hmm. That some of the shots were like, um, I think you used that already. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, this is the first section where we are looking at the uh, the movie itself. Mm-hmm. And now in the second section, I think we might even have as many as four sections. In the second <laughs> section, we're just going to speak about the historical accuracy. <laughs> so one of the things which um, troubled me a little bit um, is the... The writer of the book, mm-hmm. um, who also I think did the screenplay, yes. um, but he um, had a piece in the Guardian um, the Sunday before last, oh. and it was clear that he actually believed that when Benedict was resigning, he was consciously aware that Jorge oh. Borgoglio mm-hmm. was going to be his successor, which again is 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 impossible. Um, and so this uh, sent up red flags mm-hmm. about the, the the historical nuance, mm-hmm. the credibility of this guy's narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, before, I want you both to, to speak at length about that, but before we do, and perhaps as a segue into that, what's been the reaction on the ground <laughs> to, to to the movie, and again, not we definitely get mm-hmm. to oh, yeah. Twitter mm-hmm. and the, mm-hmm. the Stephanie Potter realms, <laughs> <laughs> but just but just person to person, like a sort yeah. of uh, what are you hearing? 
You know, it's interesting. I mentioned I was coming on the podcast to talk about this, and uh, I, a friend of mine in the building, um, Glenn, uh, he's also Catholic, grew up, did mm-hmm. a lot of youth work with him, and I said, so what do you think? What did you think? He's like, oh, I enjoyed it. I was like, Okay. Okay. He's like, oh, it's a lovely bit of fiction, like the Da Vinci Code or <laughs> Angels and Demons. You know, there's some source material there. The Vatican exists. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, there were some popes. Rose some stuff happened. <laughs> but as a fiction, he enjoyed it. Um, uh, yeah, I don't think anyone's thinking this is no. terribly accurate. Really? Not any, uh, well, nobody who actually cares about the Catholic Church yeah. in a substantive way must be. Really? I hope not. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> That's what I'm coming across as well. Yeah. I mean, I did ask when I mm-hmm. was preparing to come and speak with these great minds. Um, I did ask the folks around the office because mm-hmm. of the office I work in. <laughs> and several of them had seen it and were like, yeah. It was a good movie, but it wasn't Mm -hmm. true, but it was a good movie. I think the fact that they did cast well, um, that uh, whoever the director was, who I did know at one point, knows how to direct a story, Mm -hmm. how to make a story happen. And again, visually, it all happened in places that those who are Catholic are familiar with, Mm -hmm. are aware of, and there was enough in there that were facts that we did know are true, that it was like, oh. Okay. Oh, but wait. <laughs> yeah. The Fitbit piece not happening. Yeah. Sistine Chapel. Okay, that probably. feels real. But yeah, yeah, maybe not in the sacristy with the Fanta. But yes. maybe who knows? The pizza. Yeah. Like yeah. there, there was enough that it was a like an entertaining fiction. I think, and yeah. that was what I was hearing, even from my friends who aren't Catholic. It was the same sort of reaction of they watched it just out of some curiosity, mm. uh, yeah. and said, you know, from what little they knew of Pope Benedict, at the very least, that wasn't true. It was harder to parse for some people the Francis side of things, but the historical reality of like, oh, Benedict. Benedict retired because he knew Francis was there to pick up the mess. Like that doesn't that doesn't no. track. Yeah. You know? Okay. So what else was what else did they get wrong? Tell us things that that um, if there are any people who haven't seen this, what what should they be looking out for as a and and, and not necessarily isolated facts, but also yeah. in terms of the narrative, in terms of their portrayal. Mm-hmm. Um, you mentioned Benedict is less frail and feeble and tired and weak. Mm-hmm. I think only now is he starting to look as frail as mm-hmm. he does in the movie. Yeah. Um, to the point that when he announced um, that he was going to abdicate, uh, I remember a couple of us went, because of health? Mm-hmm. Really? I mean, yeah. so, uh, you know, he obviously knew more about his, uh, you know, his health going forward than we did. Yeah. But that mm-hmm. just, it, that portrayal of, uh, yeah, of him being doddering just, and losing his marbles a little bit at, at mm-hmm. one point, and mm-hmm. being this sort of lonely man with no friends, sitting at home watching random TV shows about cop dogs or something. I, <laughs> yes. I thought that was really funny. Yes. I was like, yeah, I could actually see him watching those, but maybe not alone. Like, he wasn't a man without friends. He was well known. Yeah. He was incredibly friendly. Uh, if he, So I know a story. There was a couple who came up to the German church right inside of the Vatican who really wanted to be married by then Cardinal Ratzinger. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't supposed to be there that day. Somebody told him he came up made sure all the mm. things were in order and, and married them. Mm-hmm. He's very yeah. personable. So this this portrayal of him as this um, very lonely introvert, yeah. in the not in the, the positive way that we're all introverts, because I am, but the sort of negative portrayal of a person who chooses to be alone mm. because they're so socially inept. Like, that doesn't that, really track. And radically out of touch. Yeah, radically out of touch. Yes. Like Which, Eleanor Rigby, ABBA. <laughs> like, like, I'm sorry. Well, yes. uh-huh. Or even that Bergoglio knew ABBA. Let's be fair. It's yeah. okay to not know ABBA. But, yeah, that sort of idea that he's so unaware of the culture. Yeah. Um, like, he had the internet. It's a thing. I'm sure he didn't spend as much time on Twitter as I do. But it's not like he hadn't heard of the yeah. pop culture from his, you know, middle age. And and, and he critiqued it. Like, And we also sort of forget that certainly into the, you know, through, through the 60s, um, Ratzinger was a... He was a reformer mm-hmm. and was considered, certainly by Neothomists, to be a liberal mm-hmm, yeah. um, and was uh, a friend of Nouveau Theology um, in a way that 
real conservatives, you know, wouldn't have been. He yeah. smoked. Yeah. <laughs> you know? He drinks a lot of beer. You know? Have you seen so many, <laughs> shot, so many yeah. shots of him with a beer sign? I love that yeah. guy. A German drinking beer out of a giant beer sign. <laughs> I've seen some pictures of him, um, again, you know, this is around the, you know, the end of the Vatican Council, mm -hmm. um, hanging out with Ron and others. He's a hipster and pope. A hipster. Like, yeah. like, like, you know, like, like that was the vibe. <laughs> and so certainly going in through the 70s, you know, he's going to be aware of, yeah. of, mm -hmm. of, of our, and that's one of the things which which and you can't expect secular media to mm -hmm. like like mm -hmm. to ha have this nuance but in in one sense benedict from the lens of secularity benedict mm -hmm. may be considered a conservative mm -hmm. but benedict is someone who engaged modernity um, wanted to take modernity um, very very seriously did take modernity very seriously does take modernity very seriously throughout the 60s and 70s um, he's in dialogue with um, Kantian modernity mm -hmm. and then as the 70s wear on he begins to offer a radical um, critique mm -hmm. of of mm -hmm. modernity and all it represents. Which you can only do if you actually know what's happening. You can't oh, do it sure. if you're, if you're yeah. set aside from the world. Yeah. You know, they're, they're showing a video of him at Castel Gandolfo. Beautiful. Love that. Yes. Um, but sort of away from everyone, away from the action, hiding away from the Vatican, reluctant to go back to the Vatican when things are going wrong mm -hmm. because he's so tucked away. Yeah. Like, that's not yeah. the reality of him. He's, no. he's always been deeply engaged. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, being the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith would not have preserved <laughs> no. him from the world, you know, Absolutely it would have not. been he would have been right in the middle of it. You know, I one of my friends joked, uh, ninety percent of the work covered by the CDF was the Jesuits, and so Francis is Mister Jesuit Fancy Pants, and he knows all the things, but there's no way Ratzinger no. could have known. No. Like, I know he knew it very well. He knew it intimately. He knew it because he had to. Because yeah. how do you critique something you don't if know? You don't and, know. And, yeah. and also the assumption only from a million miles away. Does that look like conservatism in that mm. I don't like this because it's new. I don't like this because it's change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not really sure anybody has ever actually thought that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the reason yeah. why you don't like something is not because it's new or because it's change. It's because you think it's wrong here, here, here. And deeper. this will mm -hmm. be destructive of our yeah. society, will be destructive of the human person. Um, throughout the 70s and into the 80s, um, then Ratzinger was um, in many ways a prophet of the perils mm -hmm. of late modern secular right. capitalism um, with its slide into relativism and a post-truth society. Mm -hmm. um, he can imagine things like the rise of Trump. He can imagine things like the, the, like, like, like the consequences of neoliberal capitalism, the debt it involves. Mm -hmm. um, he, can involve, he, he, can, he can imagine what a, an aridly materialist society looks like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and his problems with, for example, liberation theology is a reduction of the real to the material mm -hmm. um, and a reduction of ontological transformation to legislation and policy and a surrender of all power to the state. All these really radical, coherent critiques That's rather than I don't like the poor, <laughs> well, know, it's which, is just, which is just absurd. It's interesting because they did in a way cover that with uh, the life of Bergoglio talking about his collaboration with the state. And that's yeah. where the balance, yeah. the imbalance, or that's the fault of the film that you mm -hmm. didn't get a chance to see the richness that is Benedict. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you're given the caricature exactly that, that so many are, have picked up on about Benedict as opposed to what really made him, what called him to serve, mm -hmm. that he is serving, that he's protecting the faith because of certain things, not because mm -hmm. I don't like this or I don't like that. Yeah. It's not about rigidity. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. it's yeah. very much about being in love with the truth, and yeah. that's always been his yes, position. Absolutely. Um, and it's interesting for you know we we're culturally sort of programmed not like German people because of the war. Absolutely. Um, you know it's. Fair enough. Yeah. But, you know, so he has a very strong cadence. There's that Emperor, pa Emperor Palpatine joke. You know, he's a very severe <laughs> looking man. But if you ever bother to read his works, he's a he's a man with deep and, and authentic yeah. love uh, all through it um, for those around him, for the church, for the poor. So, yeah, I, I, yeah, and very humble. He didn't yeah. want to be pope. He didn't want to stay in the Vatican. He yeah. just wanted to go be a parish priest. He tried to resign three times and he was denied. Yeah. Exactly. And I like that about, about, yeah. about, about the movie and about... Francis. Mm -hmm. I like thinking of Francis calling him out, popes don't resign. Mm -hmm. um, because to me, that's 
a really big mistake that he made. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I do, and I, and I do think that's in keeping with Bergoglio's yep. character that he mm -hmm. would call him out over that, and rightly yep. so. I'm sure he wasn't the only one. No, um, exactly. And so I, I sort of stand in the position of having to trust the Holy Spirit on that. But it was nice as a Catholic who was so. This is the wrong word. This is too strong of a word. Traumatized a little bit when that abdication notice no. came out. It was. It was. I grieved it because he was a, the pope I had wanted. Mm -hmm. Not that my will matters at mm -hmm. all. But he was when I found it. He was elected. I literally jumped up and cheered, um, and I knew that he was so um, faithful and had such great love. Mm -hmm. So hearing him say he didn't feel like he could go on was really hard because it left a lot of feelings. One of that feeling of being abandoned, and the yeah. other of like, yeah. oh, how bad are things right now? That or how un well are you that this yeah, is what yeah. you're doing you know yeah it hit the heart when yeah. he when he said that i remember mm -hmm. the, the movie presented it very much that the ratzinger's ascent to the papacy was you know pretty much a, a foregone conclusion in its time mm -hmm. and um i remember distinctly um that the odds on him becoming pope were 16 to 1 mm -hmm. um with irish bookmaker paddy power um <laughs> i looked at the camera a there little so plug there get, for so, <laughs> so we can get some paddy power sponsorship <laughs> um, but i remember well because i was in i was in the um i was was i here i was either here or in the states i can't remember exactly where where was I? You were in the States. Was so it was two that. Oh, uh, no. No, it was 2005. 2005. He was elected, okay. right? So yeah. then we hired you. We. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just before I was yeah. So I was in the States at the time because I remember a friend of mine um, sort of emailing me or calling me up or texting mm -hmm. me or something and saying, you know, who do you, like, who do you think? And um, I was saying, well, it was, uh, I think, you know, this guy, you know, Ratzinger, and he said, I don't know, he's, he's 16 to 1. I said, you got to bet on this? <laughs> and, uh, Maybe. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can't bet on it. He said, no, I'm definitely going to have a bet. And he lumped on at hmm. 16 to 1 and made a and made a serious killing. So it shows, it shows how... How unlikely, in one sense, mm -hmm. um, Ratzinger's ascent was, and I think, you know, th that's an important part of the narrative. Mm -hmm. um, that you said you jumped up and down. Mm -hmm. um, I felt bad for him personally because I knew he didn't want yeah. the job, mm -hmm. but that's exactly who you want to be pope. <laughs> but I know people who, le uh, who 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 left the church. Now again, mm -hmm. they their their faith was hanging probably perilously close to the precipice mm -hmm. at this at this time mm -hmm. but I remember talking to them and they were saying that's it that's it I, I now know that this institution is incapable of reform yeah. that it has no um, interest in reform and by reform what they meant was that there are two or three issues which are important mm -hmm. in secular culture and that Benedict is on the wrong side of these yeah. two or three issues now again these two or three issues are um they're, they're issues that we secular culture, mm -hmm. you know, people champion, mm -hmm. but really in terms of the, the you know, the, like the, the big scheme of things, in terms of transformation of the world, the saving of the world, the saving of the environment, the liberation of the poor, you know, mm -hmm. like ra you know, coherent things. They're that they're very insignificant. But because Benedict was on the wrong side of these mm -hmm. of these things, um, they went. That's it. And and Benedict. So Benedict was always a tremendously divisive figure. Mm -hmm. yes. Um And one of the things which and I, and I want you both to speak about this. Um, a link below to um, an article I I, I wrote, um, a very pro Francis article, but in it I argued that. The vast majority of Roman Catholics, the vast majority of all Christians, get their information not first-hand from the people, they get it not first-hand from um, coherent Catholic sources, but they get it through <laughs> secular media. Yeah. And so therefore, what the church is to them is this thing that is processed through these yeah. through these hegemonic lenses. Mm -hmm. That there's, that there's that terrible old joke um, which... I think I mentioned in that in that in that article, but it's um, the joke. It's it's a bad joke, but it's um, it depends if it's 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 set in West Belfast or East Belfast, depending on who's telling the story. And so this gang of youths light light upon this person, and they say to him, "Are you a Catholic or a Protestant?" And the guy thinks for a second and goes, 
I'm a Muslim. And then the guys sort of gather and chat for a second. They come back and say, okay, you're a Catholic Muslim or a Protestant Muslim? You know? <laughs> and, 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 and whatever minor humor is there, it's, it, it's in the fact that they can't see beyond their yep. own worldview, that they're, mm-hmm. they're so yep. parochialized, all they can see is in terms of this, of this binary. Yeah. By and large, secular culture on the whole, um, you know, since the French Revolution, maybe slightly before it, is in this binary of, well, is this, is this a progressive Hindu or a, or a conservative Hindu, you no. know? <laughs> Are they, you know, if we found a group of aliens and there was a, there was a war in this alien culture, well, so are you here? who are the liberals <laughs> yeah, no. and who are the conservatives? <laughs> and then once I find out that, I can find out whose side I'm on, <laughs> yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. And you see people all the time when there's this sort of a new Twitter um, trending topic, you know? And straight away, they'll have to calibrate this relative to their mm. a sort of progressive or conservative lenses. And mm. this is brutalizing to the real. You know mm-hmm. that it sort of denigrates the real, it it, it 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 annihilates the real, and then represents it in the baby food of this uh, uh, of this conservative, mm-hmm. um, progressive either or, and one of the damaging things about that is that of the. Billion? How many Catholics on the planet? But, but a billion, is there? I think that's what the latest yeah. So, so, so of the uh, like, so of the billion Catholics on the planet, the vast majority are interpreting, experiencing, reading, thinking mm. through these lenses um, rather than the real. And so, while I'm very encouraged by you saying everyone's mm. saying, "Ah, oh, it's a it's an interesting piece of fiction," mm-hmm. I think that the Francis of this and the Benedict of this will be bequeathed to history as Francis or Benedict. Um, An example of this would be mid-20th century, early and mid-20th century Western progressive retellings of the Crusades. Mm -hmm. That what the Mm -hmm. Crusades are, you go out there and you grab someone or you invite them in, (laughs) you know, be so Mm -hmm. rough with them, and you ask them to tell you the story of the the Crusades. Mm -hmm. What they will tell you will be the story that a a historian called Runciman, um, Mm -hmm. later on, um, Runciman's history was the, was the basis for Kingdom of Heaven by Mm -hmm. um, Ridley Scott. Um, And, and and this is the truth. And one of the, that that we, that that we hold, and one of the fascinating things about something, something like ISIS, um, is that ISIS's understanding of history is largely a Western self-critical retelling of mm-hmm. historical events, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. rather than if you look at if you look exclusively at Islamic sources throughout the late medieval, early modern period, you won't find this narrative. You'll see it coming in in Western mm-hmm. tellings, and then it becomes the you the, know, the, the dominant of the day, perspective. Yeah. And so, you know, the truth. The truth is that which is bequeathed to history by the the triumph of Western um, media. And yeah. is this dangerous? I think that's complicated by the fact that in relation to some of these things, we will never actually know the truth. Mm-hmm. So when there is a void... <laughs> It's something will seek to fill it. In there. Exactly, yeah. and so um, the church, you know, as uh, you know, as a rule, does not step in to fill those voids, except for mm-hmm. maybe later when we make people saints, um, or not make them saints, announce them saints. Um, <laughs> yes. uh, and so, yeah. In the meantime, yeah, the media has taken the opportunity. They know that there's interest, and uh, there is a potential yeah. that this could become the narrative. But I think that leans too much on the fact that people care this much about who Benedict was. I think they care about who Francis is. But I think um, for most of the population, uh, Benedict will be a footnote somewhere wedged between John Paul II and Francis. And I think that's a shame. Um, I think, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if someday he was declared a doctor of the church. He's one of the most brilliant minds of our age. Mm -hmm. So um, in my very weak estimation. So, yeah, I I think I think uh, Benedict will be a footnote personally. Okay, and and I, I think hmm. I think you're probably you're probably right. That's an optimistic telling that it's not <laughs> villainized or made weak and terrible. No, I think that I think that makes sense. I think that's a very yeah. very good point. But even if that is the case, which I think it probably is, um, there still is a problem in that Francis is a heroic figure in the eyes of this of this telling mm-hmm. um, because of his shoes and. The, the, the shoes should win an Oscar. Like, they were on screen more than any of mm-hmm. the actors. We were all pretty obsessed you know? with the shoes when he first got we elected. Were. So I was like, I'm glad they picked up that thread. <laughs> I was also wondering about the, the shoes. shoes. <laughs> but, and, and, and so this this is the marker of man of the people, pastoral, progressive pope, right? Mm-hmm. Now, if his successor wears anything except sneakers, mm-hmm. if his successor wears anything except sweatpants, 
then he will be seen to be a reactionary figure. Mm-hmm. You know, um, just thinking about poor Benedict wearing all of the like the heritage of the church, all those uh, you know uh, medieval vestments, yeah. and and how people reacted to that when they saw it, um, as opposed to you know John Paul II, we mostly see wearing sort of. You know, 1980s style vestments. It's yeah. happening. It's a thing. We saw the ones at World Youth Day. They were cute. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yikes. Um, <laughs> and then you compare it to the sort of the patrimony of the church. So whoever does that, it's going to be the same thing as what Benedict experiences. Absolutely. He's a conservative, you know, all this. But one of the yeah, things that I'm happened shift. in the movie that I thought was interesting, that I, it's an expression I'd heard, so it flagged, was the Pope, the next Pope corrects the previous Pope. Yes, and Benedict, sure. I'd like yeah. to see my correction. Like, no, you don't. Um, (laughs) and so it was sort of funny what was lost on that was how is Benedict a correction of John Paul II well that's a a, a fantastic point but I'm I'm really interested and Mm. we're going to take a a break and we'll come back with our final section Mm -hmm. and what I want us to talk about I want you to talk about in our our final because I realized that I've just rabbited on for the entire this section (laughs) but in the final section what I want you to do to talk about is what it means having two popes and whether mm-hmm. that has amplified the um, the cold civil war mm-hmm. um, which exists within mm. the Roman Catholic Church, Roman mm. Catholic culture. And so um, we will come to that in one minute. So The Two Popes is a movie about two popes. <laughs> and we, for the first time in the guts of a millennium, um, have currently two, two popes alive. Mm-hmm. Um, pope and... Someone who was, well, I'm not sure if that if there's such a thing, but that's how that, that's how he's referred to, um, and this happens at a time in which people speak about the Catholic Church being in a in in, in cold civil war. Mm-hmm. Ori, could you tell the um, uh, like? I'm sure many, if not most, most of the people watching aren't going to be Roman Catholic. Mm-hmm. So, what is the cold civil war? Tell us about it. <laughs> in 30 seconds or less. Um, <laughs> and it, and the problem we have is that, is that you're very much an insider. And so... That's the hard and, part. And so it's difficult for and you. And all of this And so you, can, you can skim, and then we can skip over to Stephanie, who he, he just doesn't care. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> ready. Stephanie will call it. She's I, it's the extremes. <laughs> it's extremes yeah. which, which this this film really tries to, to right. build upon. Right. It's the extreme left, extreme right... Who is right yeah. and who is wrong, mm-hmm. um, and and having those two popes means that oh, each side, for lack right. of better terms, has their guy mm-hmm. that they can cheer for, okay. and because we haven't had this in four hundred years, seven hundred years, whatever the number was, yeah. um, it, it people are like oh oh. Does that mean he can come back, or he can't come back, or what kind of powers does he have? Yeah. Now, uh, the gentleman who wrote this, uh, Anthony McCartan, McCarran, McCartan, um, was basically saying in his preamble to the book that this idea came to him because he grew up a nominal Catholic, or not, he's now a nominal Catholic probably, uh, given some of the things that we've seen or, or viewed in the film. But he said he found himself in Rome um, just after the death of a family member Mm -hmm. and his sister had gotten in contact with him and said well because they're catholic will you light a candle at a church near you for our cousin Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so he happened to be in rome so he and his partner went to rome and or went to rome were in rome went to saint peter's square he lit a candle at saint peter's and it happened to be the morning of of an audience Mm -hmm. and he he remembers just kind of the the awe and the the atmosphere of everything when mm. Francis comes to the window, gives his address, and um, then he remembers saying to his partner, Eva, Eva, I don't know how it's spelled, saying to her, "Well, where's the other Pope?" Like it tweaked in his <laughs> mind. He said, "Wait a minute, we're listening to this guy, but where's the other guy?" Um, and it. Uh, It turns out that Ava's father um, was actually a vice chancellor at a a college, a Catholic college in Munich, and worked Mm. with Ratzinger. So she knew kind of some background details, and she said to him, "Well, he's living 
behind. <laughs> behind St. Peter's back. kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, so he's still here. Yeah. So I guess that's what tweaked in in this uh, screenwriter's mind. That's kind weird. of, okay, how... What what does this mean? What does this look like? And hence the narrative that mm -hmm. we're given. And it is very clear sort of which side he stands on or what his image mm -hmm. or what kind of story he's been formed in in yeah. regards to his Catholic faith, which he, in the book he still does say, I'm Catholic. Right. Or saying. The, the Gettysburg, the, um, mm -hmm. the Antietam, the... The the bloodstained battlefields of this civil war um, is social media. It's my mm -hmm. home too. <laughs> is, um, uh, yeah. is, is is Twitter. Mm -hmm. T so tell us what the issues are. Mm -hmm. um, help our viewers get a sense of what the what the perspectives are in this in this. Mm -hmm pre-schismatic space. <laughs> yeah, I think that's fair. Um, and this this obviously has existed um, for a long time. Um, so my experience of it, uh, sort of that progressive and more conservative side of things is very much formed by Twitter. Um, and on Twitter, there's sort of, it feels like we've formed into little factions. Yeah. <laughs> like it's sort of, you know, and, and some of us are sort of hanging out in the middle, not really sure how we feel. So there's, you know, the sort of average... Catholic who isn't taking sides. This is me with all my kids appearing like I'm the one thing while well, very much being in the middle. Uh, and then there's this progressive side and they're talking about the need for women priests. They're talking about the need for changing our theology on divorced Catholics, mm -hmm. homosexuality, um, all of this different stuff that we know are the hot button issues a lot of people um, really care about right now. They're very much at the forefront. Um, and then there's sort of the middle who want to sort of be orthodox and maintain um, the patrimony of the church as it stands today. We're fine with the Novus Ordo Mass. We don't really care if it's in Latin, English, German, mm. or whatever. Klingon? I don't know. Um, and, well, I do maybe take issue to Klingon. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to the other side and the radical side on Twitter, they call them the rad trads. At first I thought, oh, these might be my people. They are not. Mm -hmm. um, most of them have profiles of crusaders and things like that. And they're not looking so much to preserve what is the, the current patrimony of the church if, as we understand it. Um... Uh, they're looking to sort of go back to pre-Vatican II, time, and they want yeah. you know women to wear veils. Not that veiling is wrong, and lots of people in the middle wear veils too. Um, and, and yeah, they have a sort of a, what we would even call a, like an anti-progressive viewpoint. Mm -hmm. They want to regress back to uh, an era of much more clericalism, um, no role for women in the church, uh, no girl altar servers. It's almost a time over tradition. They want to go back to a particular time in our church as opposed to... Exactly. So yeah, it, there's sort of this... this um, it, it's like the people who, who love the 1950s anyway, and they want to wear the swing dresses and... Mm -hmm. uh, I'm actually that person too. Shoot, um, <laughs> it's not really promoting myself. Well. But they want to do that with the liturgy. They want to do yeah. that with the the theology of the church. Um, so they look to Pius the Twelfth as one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, Pius the Tenth as one of those heroes. So they see modernity as really anything after the 1930s, um, whereas we see modernity as kind of the right now that's happening. Um, so it, when you get on Twitter, when you're in that space, you see there's there's a fight brewing. Huge. You can't post about anything. Like, you can't post about Beyonce without people having a Catholic yeah. church opinion about her. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you're not a Catholic or you're not a Catholic. So there's a lot of time spending saying you're not the right kind of Catholic. So we all know, uh, or maybe we know James R. Martin. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a Jesuit from the States who talks a lot about LGBTQ issues. He's, again, he's one of these very divisive figures on Catholic. Catholic Twitter that you either love him mm -hmm. or literally want to crucify him. This seems to be the only two, <laughs> or you just ignore him. Um, so yeah, so this is this movie kind of comes in that sweet spot of, like you were saying, Oria, putting up the two heroes. Benedict is the hero of uh, the sort of the middle leaning towards the right side people. Mm -hmm. And Francis is the one that everyone who's on the progressive side loves because he's yeah. made some big moves visually. It appears. It's not really big mm -hmm. moves. No. But, you know, the, the thing about communion for divorced Catholics, <clears throat> which if you read isn't as uh, easy as it mm -hmm. sounds, uh, just the way that he's talking to people out in the world, out in the public. You know, he's giving this a very open perspective of a church that's 
it's going to change when the reality mm-hmm. is the church is not going to change its perspective on uh, abortion or um, the truth. The truth, exactly. He loves the truth too. Um, the way he expresses it uh, is in a way that everyone's acting like he's the first person who ever <laughs> loved the environment. Um, yeah. You know, and, and that's that's just not the case. So it's interesting to me the way that this movie dug into those tropes and and did it in such a way that irritated anyone who didn't <laughs> who wasn't a radical progressive. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So that's going to be one of the, I think, the shocks mm-hmm. for many people listening to or watching this podcast, um, the idea that within, mm-hmm. and this will scare them and, and, and annoy them, but that within the Catholic worldview, mm-hmm. um, Benedict isn't a rad trad. No, <laughs> he know? is not. The rad trads hate him. And so, and so <laughs> yeah. uh, on the right of, of Catholicism, you have um, one that Vatican II and the and the new mass um, mm-hmm. is um, is essentially a McDonald's happy meal and mm-hmm. isn't actually the mass at all, mm-hmm. and so therefore we've been not doing liturgy yeah. um, for for quite some time. Don't have real priests. These people, <laughs> exactly. these people are yeah, these people are integrationists, by which they mean um, the integration of church and state, such that a a Catholic inspired mm-hmm. um, kind of quasi-theocracy mm-hmm. um, similar to but even more Catholic than Franco-Spain um, would be their ideal political mm-hmm. political space and that um, there is zero salvation for anybody who isn't not just a Catholic but also a particular kind well, of the Catholic. The right kind you know? of Catholic, yeah. Yes. And, yeah, so, yeah. and so that would be in, in, in a sense the Catholic right and there would be there's always the whiff of anti-Semitism mm-hmm. there. There's mm-hmm. th- th- there's an awful lot of, of of issues there, and it's usually, as you mentioned, Crusader George's Cross kind of th- mm-hmm. kind of things. There's th- there's also kind of a, a, a radical Western or Eurocentrism there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, then um, on the left, you would have um, a, a vast number of people for whom the the policies by and large of the Liberal Party in Canada, NDP, or the US Democrats Mm -hmm. in relation to um, sexuality, in relation to Mm -hmm. women's reproductive issues, Mm -hmm. um, certainly obviously in relation to things like women priests, which are not necessarily those political issues, but, um, but those issues would represent the like, like the mm-hmm. progressives then, so that how can um, the church modernize mm-hmm. to reflect um, good enlightened modern perspectives mm-hmm. in terms of um, access to abortion, um, same-sex unions, etc., etc., etc. And one of the, the curious ironies is that um, Benedict and Francis are largely uniform mm-hmm. um, doctrinally yeah. on all those topics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but nonetheless, do you believe or do you think that, at least stylistically or, or anyway, that it's a kind of a chicken and egg situation? Has the, the, the two popes as, a, as, as an extant reality fuel the fires of this civil war? If there was only one pope, mm-hmm. Franciscus, mm-hmm. if, would this be tempered a wee bit? Our reaction to it? Well, the would the would the would the culture wars mm. existent within the church would that be toned down? Um, does the existence of Benedict um, uh, empower um, right wingers who mm. would say like the amount of people mm-hmm. in the church who believe that Francis is a terrible pope? He's huge. Mm-hmm. But there's a big difference between thinking he's a terrible pope and thinking he's the anti-pope. So this right. is that part that I'm hearing is, uh, uh, you, let's say we liked Benedict, if this is if this is the argument for this side, because there are some people on the far right who do like, who did like Benedict. They feel like he's been usurped and that Francis mm-hmm. is a false pope. So the death of Benedict at this point wouldn't resolve that issue. Um, if anything, it would just leave them in a situation where they'd Feel like there was now no pope. There's they would be. Abandoned. They would become the next generation of sedes. Like so, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, there's no pope in the chair. Yeah. Uh, so I think yeah, this movie is an expression of a cultural moment on the fringes of the Catholic Church. I don't think it's happening at the. Se- yeah. I don't think the average person in the pew is thinking a ton about this right no. now. No. 
I think right. no, those I of us think who so. spend a lot of time thinking about the church on yeah. one end or the other are obsessing about it. Yeah. Um, but that's it's not okay. a healthy For description folks, of the church I'm, proper. I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm with you. Mm-hmm. Um, nonetheless, we have... So let's take the US as, a, as, a, as an example mm-hmm. of a radically polarized mm-hmm. society mm-hmm. where you would have Fox News on the one hand and you would have... CNN, MSNBC, Mm -hmm. whatever, uh, on the other hand. Mm -hmm. Um, Within Catholicism, you do have on one side um, LifeSite News, Mm -hmm. um, that um, church militant vortex, Mm -hmm. scary thing, Mm -hmm. um, genuinely scary thing. Um, (laughs) And on the other hand, you would have National Catholic Reporter um, and then, I suppose, Commonweal. and so you do have the, the media outlets. And so while this podcast, like we're going to have, um, you know, a few hundred views on Twitter mm-hmm. and a few hundred listens on um, on whatever audio platform. If you look at someone like uh, Taylor Marshall's podcast mm-hmm. or if you go to Church Militant, and I'll, I'll link to these things b- below as well if you're watching on, on Twitter, you'll see videos with tens and hundreds of thousands. Mm-hmm. Um, now again, hundreds of thousands relative to Catholics is a mm-hmm. tiny little drop in the, in the mm-hmm. ocean. Mm-hmm. But it's a much larger portion of the of the vocal and active and operative and decision and opinion mm-hmm. forming mm-hmm. Catholics, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so y- you're right that you go to the pew, so, you know, you know, it's just... Do you, just, think, you, do know, you think Francis is the anti-Pope? <laughs> nobody cares. Nobody cares. <laughs> nobody, like, 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 nobody cares, but mm-hmm. while I don't know if, if, if Church Militant or if mm-hmm. Taylor Marshall or any of these people have said Pope Francis is the anti-Pope. Mm. Church Militant, maybe, I don't know. But you know that they kind of think that. They're mm-hmm. hinting. There's and little they're, dog and whistles. They're, and, and they're strongly but. suggesting. And you're, you're talking about people who do have hundreds of thousands, like hundreds mm-hmm. and hundreds of thousands of Catholics. And you do also have, if a, if a portion of donations to Catholic thought shapers, mm-hmm. that's a massive portion. Like there's an awful lot of funding there. Um, and and and, yes. and while and while Pope Benedict um, isn't necessarily fanning those flames, one wonders if Cardinal Burke is at times mm. open mm. to flirting with that. And you've also got Steve Bannon, who is who, who is mm. looking to do business with that mm-hmm. that wing of Catholicism and is um and is fueling and funding um, mm. thought. And on the other side, you have. George Soros and, and and others funny things. So, so like like like, like so. I'm I'm wondering about what you think about the two popes vis a vis our our very fractured state. Mm-hmm. And again, you're 100 percent right. Mm-hmm. You go to the pews of any parish, people don't know, no. they don't care. Mm-hmm. But that's always been the case. It's always been the case that the average you know American isn't going to be madly interested in. Um, this or that um, development leading up to the U.S. Civil War, mm-hmm. and yet you've got a, a small numerical group who are highly animated, highly active, and they're the ones who, through mm-hmm. funds and mm-hmm. through the shaping of opinion, will lead to, in what, what in our case would be schism. Yeah, it's a vocal minority, and we know that in in mm-hmm. all sorts of issues. So um, done, we've done some polling across Canada about all sorts of social issues, and the people who are radically for certain social issues, like very pro-abortion at all stages of life, are a very small portion of the population. Um, but you know, their their work is very funded. So this is the same idea, but on the other side, and we can see it in, in America. Um, it's it sometimes feels more obvious in American politics because they only really have the two parties. Yeah. Ours. You know, we're split up and everybody, you know, we're there is definitely a left and right in Canada, but uh, the left has a lot more parties. Mm. Um, so, yeah, in America, you can see that sort of dichotomy of there's really loud, angry voices on either side who are informing public opinion. It's uh, it's like trickle down economics, except mm-hmm. it's with our communications. You know, most average people aren't going to hear that very high level. Francis is the anti-pope, no. or Benedict betrayed the church. They're just going to hear unrest. They're going to. Tr- it's going to trickle down to a sense of unrest about 
I don't know why, but I don't like that Francis guy, or I really like that Francis guy. Right, it's a surface mm-hmm. understanding mm-hmm. as opposed to any sort of depth or, or researched or mm-hmm. informed mm-hmm. decision. Um, and like you said, it all those views, all that influence is a very small portion of what is Catholic mm-hmm. in our world. I, I often forget because this is the world we live in. It's, we're so much it's in it. North yeah. America, that it we are the be-all and end-all of the Catholic world. Well, mm. Africa and Asia and other areas have way more Catholics than we do, and mm. they may not feel like they have influence, but because I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know that world. I mm. don't know the church in, in Morocco. I don't know what's happening. Yeah. Well, a good expression of that is that yeah. woman, uh, that Asian woman who grabbed the Pope, who right. reportedly she was talking about the state of Christians in China and Hong Kong, and she was, uh, th- I mean, again, this is I just getting the filtered reporting. I can't. Mm-hmm. I couldn't understand the language. It wasn't loud enough. But that sense of the rest of the world is out there living the church and suffering and and screaming for attention. And here we are in North America, polarized and Unless obsessing Europe, about which pope um, is. That's yeah. right. So the sort of the um, we would call that uh, the minority world, which is those of us who live in privilege, mm-hmm. um, in the sense of Catholicism. The minor- the minority of Catholics live here in the, in the first mm-hmm. world. Um, so yeah, we're we're. We're here kicking and screaming over stuff like this, and it's consuming our media. Um, Twitter was a great example of that. It's consuming the Catholic Twitter yeah. feed, talking about these sorts of things immensely. Immensely, um, and then you know that the majority of Catholics just don't care because they've got far more pressing issues afoot. So, yeah, I think it is consuming our our media cycle and our thought processes about the church that we're caring about that more than we're caring about the stuff we're supposed mm-hmm. to as church sometimes. Like, I, I love a good bit of politics and some insider mm-hmm. stuff. I mean, who didn't love the Meghan and Harry bit this week? I'm like, ooh, the queen didn't know. Like, so we love that gossipy feeling of being engaged in what the privileged yeah. class are doing. But it's so inconsequential to my daily life. Unless Megan moves next door, I literally don't care what she does. Um, so I, I feel like in some ways with the church, maybe we should be less obsessed about this stuff and more obsessed about what we're doing on what the we're ground. supposed to do. Yeah, exactly. I think you're right. I think you're right. I think <sighs> I agree 100% in terms of what we should do. Um, but that's not what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're not. We're trying to. Because we're selfish but, and it's so much more fun to talk about the gossip. And I also think that... It's a slight falsehood to equate the, well, we are, sadly, still too clerical. Mm -hmm. Um, The people who are going to be priests, bishops, Mm -hmm. and cardinals are being shaped far more by this culture than the people who are are on the ground. Mm -hmm. Um, And therefore, if the church is going to be shaped by these people, the church is going to be shaped by these conversations. Yeah. You're also 100% right that this reflects um, Western post-enlightenment mm-hmm. polarization. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But if you look at the African church, um, y- you will see a similar a similar distinction. Now, again, mm-hmm. between and, and, and this is divided a little bit on, on, on racial lines, that on the one hand you have um, Cardinal Sarah, and on the other hand you would have Cardinal Napier. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, these cardinals a kind of represent sides mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the and the basic position that we that we see with Cardinal Sarah and the church that he represents, which is the majority African church, is that these Western Europeans and their um, illegitimate North American children are um, are lunatics for mm-hmm. em- embracing these ridiculous Western ideals, mm-hmm. and on the other hand, you have a more progressive, forward-looking um, Cardinal mm-hmm. Napier, mm-hmm. representative of a sort of a, a, a South African. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. Church, mm-hmm. and so, and and you could find analogs in um, analogs in, in in Latin America. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Chico Tegel is probably one of the one of the <laughs> few who you know, and therefore mm-hmm. he's you know, if you're getting your money on good nearly for the next Pope, you know, oh, he could be one of the he seems, to, he seems to bridge. <laughs> oh, <I know>. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, but you know, you, but, but sadly for ill, mm. not for, mm. for good, but for yeah. ill, our narratives 
become the narratives, mm-hmm. um, sadly. Yeah. And um, and is there anything, and this could be the like the closing word, if the two popes feeds into this narrative and comes from this narrative and, and finds the fames of this narrative, mm-hmm. you as influencers, as uh, communications directors, as opinion formers, what should we, you, be looking to do to... Um, to, to, to overcome this polarization. Learn to tell our story better. Mm-hmm. Yeah, get engaged in that part yeah. of the storytelling. Don't let don't let the secular media come in and tell it for us yes. and give such a negative perspective. I think, too, um, we need to work as the laity to stop being obsessed with the gossip cycle okay. uh, yep. and get focused on holding our bishops and the princes of the church to account about their behavior and activity. If, you know, if we're so bad about how somebody's acting, there's nothing wrong with, you know, if I... I having the conversation. Having a, con- having a loving yep. conversation. I realize that, you know, I I have a tremendous privilege that I could go up to our bishop and say, hey, I can't imagine a particular circumstance, <laughs> but, you know, I really didn't like it when you said X or when you did that X, or even better, I really wish you would open the archives for this, that, or the other thing so that people could know yeah. the truth about all of these things that are happening. Um, so, yeah, as a lady, we, we're big enough that it's okay for us to ask. Like, we're all children of God. God has given our bishops so much responsibility and so much privilege. It's okay for us to come alongside them and say, we want you to prayerfully consider Mm-hmm. Being being a better example of Christian leadership. Yeah, to be in dialogue with them. And I think mm-hmm. at this particular time in our local church, that is the aim of the current leadership. Agreed. That it it isn't about what the bishop does or what the bishop says. To one level, yes, because mm-hmm. he is the chief shepherd of this diocese. But he, in particular, the current bishop, has sought to consult with not mm-hmm. only his clergy, but the lay people. Mm-hmm. Whether or not lay people have taken up those opportunities is another question, but um, the door is open for dialogue. Mm-hmm. We are at a place in our current church because that is what the convers- where the conversations, where mm-hmm. the prayer, where reflections yeah. have led us. And that is only because of the fruit of, of working together as the people of God, not mm-hmm bishops deciding one thing, clergy deciding another thing, and laity, mm-hmm. but coming together with the mix of of opinions, of mm-hmm. understandings, of and, knowledge. And is discipleship a, a sort of a like a, like a forum for the, for, for that? For I would say so. For for a non secularized because so much of 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 the communications mm-hmm. can be you know arid um, communiques. And press releases, yeah. which are kind of jump. But <laughs> discipleship is a really good example of a of a, a of a coherently Catholic. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yes, perspective. Uh, discipleship is one, and, uh, and other ways in which we're able to tell th- the stories, mm-hmm. right? The stories about who our leaders are, who our church leaders are, mm-hmm. well, what kind of phone they use, whether it's an iPhone or an Android. Mm-hmm. Do they play what? sports? Oh, do, do they play sports? <laughs> it's not why, at least. <laughs> <laughs> but it, and just that that humanness and that mm-hmm. sense of, of I am a child of God and this mm-hmm. is how I am using my gifts or how mm-hmm. I'm feeling called to live it out in this world and how I'm supported in that. That is hopefully what we we try to do when we we tell the stories because it is, again, up to us to tell the story or else somebody else will. And it's important to say we're part of that story. I mean, the the part about this movie that was really tough is it was the story of the two popes. We got some pan shots of people in the crowd. Exactly, But at at the end of the day, you know, I'm the one standing on my couch cheering when Benedict is elected. Not that I want to be in the movie in my jammies. That should be podcast, by the way. (laughs) That's a whole other. That's a whole other yeah. issue. But I, I think you know, at the parish level, um, we've been really blessed that we've been invited to take ownership of our engagement in the church. Mm-hmm. We have to stop thinking of our priests and our bishops as someone we pay to be professional Christians yes. for us. Yeah. You know, I, I remember growing up expecting my priest to be at everything, to be leading everything, to say every grace prayer at a meal. Uh, the reality is. We're the body of Christ too. Mm-hmm. We we're priests, prophets, and kings, uh, and I have a responsibility to get out there 
and be church and to shape the way my church community is. Um, And so the way, yeah, the way our culture is shaped at the bottom, our priests are so informative of that. But if we as the laity are just sitting there Mm dead-eyed and and not engaged, there's no amount of wonderful priests, bishops, popes um, that's going to keep the church uh, alive, thriving, and on on the route for its mission. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Stephanie Potter, Ori Saudi. Thank you both very, very much, and um, hopefully we'll have you back sometime for, for whenever there's another blockbuster <laughs> about the church. Thanks again. Thank, Thank you. you.